Good morning, uh, good afternoon, or even good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. My name is Dominique Bergeon, and I am the director of the FA office in Geneva. And it's really my pleasure to welcome you today to the sixth session of the FAO in Geneva Social Protection Dialogue Series. This dialogue series is typically organized in collaboration with the FAO Rural Transformation and Gender Equality uh, Division. However, uh, this uh, session is unique as it is the first time we also invite and collaborate with our colleagues from the Nutrition Dialogue Series, the Food and Nutrition Division of FAO, and the Brussels Liaison Office, providing a comprehensive view of the role of social protection in improving nutrition outcomes. In addition, this dialogue series is jointly co-hosted with the World Food Program. I would really like to express our gratitude uh, to both organizations, social protection and nutrition teams for their dedication to making this dialogue possible. Today's session aims to deepen our understanding of how social protection can address the root causes of malnutrition in all its forms, be it undernutrition, overweight, obesity, or micronutrient deficiencies, including food security, food insecurity, economic barriers to to health diet, to healthy diets, inadequate care, and feeding practices, and limited access to health services. Today's session also aims to inform a more coherent approach across the humanitarian development peace nexus. Furthermore, this series built upon the expertise and collaboration within the United Nations uh, Food Systems uh, Summit Coalition on Social Protection and Food Systems for Improved Nutrition and Resilient Livelihoods. For more than two years now, this coalition has brought together experts from government, international organizations, civil society, and academia to strengthen national social protection systems and to accelerate progress on poverty and malnutrition reduction and foster resilient livelihoods. Now, it is uh, with pleasure that I would like to hand over the floor to our moderator today, uh, Lauren Phillips. Lauren, over to you. Thank you so much, Dominique, and um, welcome to all of you, whether it's good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Um, as Dominique mentioned, I'm Deputy Director of the Rural Transformation and Gender Equality Division at FAO Headquarters. And I'm very pleased to join in this interesting session, which is including our colleagues in nutrition and WFP, as Dominique mentioned. Um, let me just share a little bit about how the session will be structured today, and then I'll introduce you to some of our speakers and panelists. Um, so we're going to be together for around 90 minutes for this webinar. It's being recorded. Uh, please do keep yourself mic your microphone muted during the session, and we encourage you to post comments and questions using the Q&A box, which you can see at the bottom of your screen. Um, so the session today is going to begin with presentations by four distinguished speakers who I'm going to introduce to you now. Uh, Professor Stephen Devereaux, um, who is the research fellow at the Institute of Development Studies in the UK. Mr. John Hodinot, who is Professor of Food and Nutrition Economics and Policy at Cornell University in the United States. Annalise Borrell, who is the Senior Advisor on Nutrition and Social Protection at UNICEF's Nutrition and Child Development Program, and Mr. Paulo Napa, who is the Social Pol Protection Deputy Director of Uganda's Ministry of Gender, Labor, and Social Development. So I thank all four of you for being here. Um, and their presentations will try to give both a theoretical and a practical framework to better understand how social protection can contribute to address all forms of malnutrition in both development contexts and in fragile and conflict contexts. Um, after we hear from our four distinguished panelists, we will have uh, our pr presenters, apologies, we'll have a panel discussion with um, a variety of colleagues. So that will be led by he uh, Helen Berton, who's policy officer at the European Commission's Director General for International Partnerships, and Saul Morris, who's Director of Program Services at the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition or GAIN. And Helen and Saul will share their initial reactions to those presentations and help set the scene for our conversation. 
Um, and then I'm going to ask the, the panelists some questions and then it will be over to you um, for your questions. And we will finalize with our colleague, Abigail Perry, who's director of nutrition at WFP and a member of the UN Nutrition Steering Committee who will help us close the event. So Helen, Sal and Abigail, it's also a pleasure to have you with us here today. Um, and I'm very uh, looking forward to hearing all of your interventions and presentations. So just to add a little bit more background to Dominique's introduction, I think everyone here is probably aware of the fact that global hunger has reached its highest levels in 15 years in 2022, uh, with over three, 730 million people suffering from undernourishment, which is an increase of 160 million from 2017. Um, additionally, uh, in 2023, uh, conflict, uh, economic shocks, and weather extremes due to climate change have led to more than 280 million people experiencing acute food insecurity. Um, we also know that child malnutrition is showing mixed trends over the past decade. Uh, while the number of stunted and wasted children under five dropped, uh, encouragingly by 35 million over the past decade, the number of overweight children has increased by 4 million. Uh, and despite this sort of positive trend on stunting and wasting, more than 230 million children still suffer from malnutrition globally. Um, while social protection policies and programs are obviously crucial for reducing poverty and food insecurity, they don't automatically lead to better nutritional outcomes. So nutri nutrition sensitive social protection explicitly aims to address the kinds of malnutrition challenges that I just mentioned by ensuring that the most vulnerable have access to healthy diets, health services and nutritious foods by linking um, economic sectors, uh, food sectors and health systems. Additionally, shock responsive social protection programs can help households to cope with crises by providing targeted assistance and reducing the risk of acute food insecurity turning into chronic malnutrition. The strategy would ensure that social protection continues to address routine needs while expanding to meet the demands arising from you know, a variety of different shocks and complementing humanitarian assistance. So with that introduction and the sobering statistics that I've just mentioned, as well as the opportunities presented by nutrition sensitive social protection, I'd like to pass over to our first speaker, um, Professor Stephen Navarro. Uh, Stephen, we know that part of your work focuses on the role of social protection on the reduction of poverty and food insecurity and the improvement of rural livelihoods. Can you help us understand what we mean by social protection and how our thinking about social protection and nutrition has evolved since the high level panel of experts on food security and nutrition at, at CFS released social protection for food security, which was a report that was published 12 years ago. Over to you, Stephen, thank you. Thank you very much, Lauren, for that introduction. And um, certainly I will try my best to answer those questions, but we have very little time to do so, and they're very complex and challenging questions. Um, I'm going to talk for just a few minutes on um, the questions you've asked and then hand over to my co-speaker, John Hodnot. And I should mention that John and I were two of the co-authors of this HLPE report that you mentioned for the Committee on World Food Security, which was called Social Protection for Food Security back in 2012. Uh, in the social protection world, and also I would say in the food security field, 2012 seems a very long time ago. So much has changed since then. So what I want to do is I want to mention five shifts in thinking and practice that have happened in the last decade or so, and their implications for this dialogue on nutrition sensitive social protection across the humanitarian development peace nexus. And then I will hand over to John to talk about the impact of social protection on food security and nutrition outcomes. I'm going to start by looking, in fact, at food security. So the first shift I want to talk about is from food availability to food access. Originally, food security meant food availability, and the policy focus led by agencies like FAO was on improving, improving food supplies through raising food production and crop yields. Uh, of course, the Green Revolution being a famous example of that. But then the focus shifted to access to food, recognizing that the most food insecure households are those that lack the purchasing power to buy the food that they need. Social protection focuses on providing access to food, either directly through food transfers, e.g. food aid, school feeding, food for work programs, or indirectly through cash transfers to finance food purchases. Uh, and WFP calls this food assistance, you know, ways of getting people access to food without necessarily giving them food directly. So social protection supported this shift in emphasis from 
of food security thinking from availability to access, while recognizing, of course, that both are essential. You can't have access to food if there is no food, so you need to have both availability and access. So that's the first important shift that's really become entrenched in the, in the thinking and practice in the last um, dozen or so years. The second shift is from food security to food security and nutrition. And looking at this from a social protection point of view, what we discovered is many evaluations of social protection programs found a paradox. Cash transfers almost always improve food security indicators like meals per day or dietary diversity scores. But anthropometric indicators of malnutrition, for example, child stunting, did not necessarily improve. So you can give a household cash and you'll see improvement in food security indicators, but not necessarily in nutrition outcomes. And one reason for this is that food security is necessary but not sufficient to guarantee nutrition security, which also requires a healthy, balanced diet, access to clean water, hygienic sanitation facilities and practices, good childcare, educated mothers, and so on. And that's why we talk more about food security and nutrition these days than we talk about just food security, because they're not the same thing and just achieving one doesn't automatically achieve the other. So nutrition sensitive social protection recognizes that simply increasing access to food is not enough to address the range of requirements for good nutrition outcomes. And this insight led to the third shift in thinking that I want to focus on, which is from cash transfers to cash plus. In the early days of social protection, say in the, in the late 90s, early 2000s, there was a big focus on unconditional and conditional cash transfers. And the assumption behind this was that people who were very poor simply faced cash constraints. If you give them cash, it can solve almost all the problems that they face. And there was even a book that came out called Just Give Money to the Poor. Again, the assumption being that all that poor people need is cash to alleviate their liquidity constraints and to give them the purchasing power to buy food and other services. As our understanding has improved in the last years, cash transfers started to be linked increasingly to nutrition sensitive interventions like behavior change communication on the importance of hand washing, um, providing fresh food vouchers to ensure that people are, are, are accessing healthy food and nutrition supplements for adolescent girls, pregnant and lactating women. This is called cash plus, this, the linkages between cash and other services or making sure that people have access to good information, good food, uh, good healthy diets. All of that requires more than just giving people cash on its own. So we talk about cash trust, pl cash plus, meaning linkages to other, other services. Um, and this cash plus approach does seem to improve nutrition outcomes from social protection programs much more effectively than simply cash transfers. But I will leave it to John to share the evidence on this. The fourth shift of the five I want to mention is from social protection programs to social protection systems. Now, if we go back again 20 years or so, social protection often arrived in the global south in the form of small scale pilot projects that scaled up or didn't scale up to national programs. Over time, these projects and programs became institutionalized within systems that included unified databases for targeting, registration and beneficiary management. It included electronic payment mechanisms, for example, mobile money transfers, and it included sustainable financing modalities, recognizing that donors who often provided initial money weren't going to be, uh, be able to fund, fund the entire program at national scale indefinitely. Now, social protection systems are important because they provide mechanisms and platforms beyond just the modality of cash or food. They provide mechanisms and platforms that can be leveraged for rapid response during emergencies. And this leads on to the fifth and final shift in social protection from safety nets to shock responsive social protection. So again, going back to the early days, social protection was conceptualized as a developmental intervention. The aim was to alleviate poverty and to help poor and vulnerable people manage risk. But social protection is increasingly used in humanitarian response, emergency cash transfers, for example. And the best example that we have of this is our experience with COVID-19. What we found is that countries that had well-functioning social protection systems in place were better able to respond quickly and effectively to the livelihood shock that was created by COVID-19 lockdowns. They did this by a combination of vertical expansion, which means giving more benefits to existing beneficiaries, and horizontal expansion, registering new beneficiaries temporarily until lockdowns were lifted. In other words, they built on the existing architecture that was in place um, to deliver emergency or humanitarian relief 
but using social protection systems and, and mechanisms that were already there. And that was much more effective than starting new programs from, from nothing. So shock responsive social protection is more sophisticated and more effective than old style social safety nets, which dominated this, this literature in the 80s and 90s. In fact, safety nets was the third prong of the World Bank's um, poverty development, World Development Report on Poverty, um, when they saw it as very much a residual form of assistance, which, and, but the problem with social safety nets is that they usually arrived um, too late and they were usually inadequate. If you build on existing social protection architecture, you can do a much more, a much better job of um, uh, reaching your developmental goals, your, your nutrition and, and poverty reduction goals, as well as supporting people during crises. So to conclude, um, in the last 10 to 15 years, social protection has proved its value as a set of policy tools that can contribute to all three legs of the humanitarian development and peace nexus. Thank you and over to John. Thank you so much for outlining those big shifts. I think you did a, a very uh, admirable job of uh, going through a very complex question. And uh, Professor Hodden, it's my pleasure to pass to you to sort of deepen some of the um, findings and the evidence about the impact of social protection on household food security and on nutrition. So let me pass to you, over to you. Uh, thank you, Lauren. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. I noticed from the bottom of my screen, we have something like 80 participants, which is uh, great. I want to begin with an observation that uh, Stephen made, which is that much has changed in terms of our thinking around social protection over the last 10 to 12 years. And that is also true of the evidence base around uh, the impact that social protection can have on food and nutrition security. And in the time I have available, I'm going to cover three points. The evidence base of cash transfers on food security, the evidence base on the relative merits of food and cash transfers, and the evidence base of cash transfers on children's nutritional status. With respect to the first, the evidence base is now strong and unambiguous that cash transfers improve food security. There is, however, a subtlety here, which is the impacts on food security vary somewhat by the metrics we use to measure food security and the characteristics of the target population we're reaching. Specifically, for very, very food insecure households, those with caloric acquisition well below requirements, much of this cash goes on acquiring calories. A very rough rule of thumb is that for every 10% income boost derived from a social protection intervention, caloric acquisition increases by about 6%. But for slightly better off, but still food insecure households, cash goes on both calories and on improving diets, purchasing fruits, vegetables, animal source, and other nutrient dense foods. There is not much evidence that it gets spent on things like soft drinks, sweets, and alcohol. So the evidence on food security is strong and ambiguous. It improves both caloric acquisition and diet quality. When Stephen and I participated in the 2012 HLPE report, we did so at a time where there was very oftentimes very heated discussions over the relative merits of food and cash transfers. But at that time, the evidence base on the relative effectiveness of these uh, was very limited. On this, I think we're now in a much different space. And there are four stylized facts which I think have emerged over the last 10 to 12 years. First, Food transfers clearly are more expensive to implement. As a rough rule of thumb, for the same budget and transfer level, a cash transfer can reach 15% more beneficiaries than a food transfer. And those cost differences are driven primarily by the transport and storage and distribution costs associated with food, which are considerably higher than an equivalent cash transfer. Food transfer, second point, food transfers increase caloric acquisition, but usually do not diversify diets. In other words, if you provide a household with a food ration, say of pulses, uh, rice, and micronutrient fortified cooking oil, they consume more rice, pulses, and micronutrient uh, fortified cooking oil, but they don't necessarily diversify their diets in other ways. 
third. Having set points A and B, it's important to remember that food transfers remain an important part of the toolkit when physical access to food is a concern. If people do not have access to food in markets, uh, then providing them with cash when there's nothing to buy is obviously not going to be terribly helpful. And finally, one of the tenants now in development generally, but particularly in the social protection space, is to take into account the attitudes and wishes of potential clients when designing programs. And beneficiary attitudes towards food as opposed to cash transfers is complex. When prices are stable, households often prefer cash because of the greater flexibility it brings to buy a greater variety of goods. But when prices are rising or when they are variable, households will prefer food. To frame this differently, one of the things we should think about when we're thinking about a modality of food or cash is to say who's going to bear the price risk associated with variations in prices in food prices. Is that going to be the clients or is that going to be the organizations who fund the program? And finally, there is some evidence that really food insecure households prefer food transfers, possibly because they have greater difficulty uh, physically accessing food. On this, for example, Think of elderly widows who might find it difficult to travel to food markets. On the final component, or the final point I want to make, the impact of cash transfers on children's nutritional status, Stephen has done a very good job of setting this up. If we look at particularly the two systematic reviews which have been published in the last three to four years, they find generally either no impact on the anthropometric indicators we care most about, a wasting or stunting, or impacts which are very, very small in magnitude. Similarly, as a general proposition, we find small, very small effects on measures of chronic undernutrition, such as stunting or height for age, uh, Z or Z scores. Why is this the case? Well, as Stephen alluded, Cash transfers are necessary, but not sufficient to improve uh, children's nutritional status. Although it provides household resources, it may not address all the barriers in place which affect children's nutrition, such as barriers around health, around diet quality, around behaviors. The diet quality point links back to our evidence base around cash transfers. When we find cash transfers are improving household caloric acquisition, but not dietary quality, such results are consistent with the limited effects we observe on children's nutritional status. Given an increasing evidence base, both from the social and biological sciences, points to the importance of improvements in diet quality, particularly uh, nutrient-rich foods, such as animal source foods, as well as fruits and vegetables, on improving children's nutritional status. This then places, in a, places us in a position of considering whether or not cash plus interventions could be more effective at improving children's nutritional status. For example, twinning cash transfers with nutritional, social, behavioral, social and behavioral change. On this, the evidence base or the strong evidence base is more limited but there, is, there are some promising results from a number of countries that suggest that twinning cash and nutrition behavior communication change has larger effects on children's nutritional status than cash alone. Why? Because it addresses these multiple barriers, not just the need to improve caloric acquisition, but to improve behaviors, particularly around optimal child feeding practices and child diet quality. Thank you very much. I look forward to our panel discussion in a few minutes. Thank you, John. That was so interesting and very informative. We really appreciate you going through um, all of the evidence, well, as, as much as you could in, in that short a period of time. Um, I'm going to now pass the floor over to uh, Annalise. Um, so Annalise um, from Annalise Borrell from UNICEF. We would like to sort of hear about how UNICEF has been supporting governments in using social protection to reduce child malnutrition in development and humanitarian contexts. I see you're sharing your screen, so let me pass straight to you. Uh, we look forward to hearing your presentation. 
Thanks very much, Lauren, and uh, good afternoon, good good morning, everybody. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Annalise Borrell. I'm the Senior Advisor for Nutrition and Social Protection. And today I'd like to build on the important concepts, the important evidence, the shifts that uh, Stephen Devereaux and uh, John Hudden have, have described, and perhaps just take now a focus on what does this look like in practice. So in UNICEF, we have also recognized that there have been significant shifts. We've acknowledged these shifts. And over the last couple of years, we've been looking at our programs and, uh, and um, where we're working across the world and looking at how our programs are building synergies between the social protection programs and nutrition programs so that we have greater impact on nutrition and poverty. So in this in this in next uh, 10 minutes or so, I'd like to share um, some of the learning, some of the examples and our framework that comes from our uh, programming uh, guidance that we have developed in UNICEF. Next slide, please. Um, but our starting point is our program framework. So in UNICEF, we recognize that social protection itself and nutrition our programs in themselves are and are important and do have a contribution towards reducing poverty and malnutrition. But we believe and we've observed that where we build strong synergies between these programs, that there is much greater impact. So on the left hand side, we recognize in, in UNICEF's framework for social protection, of course, we recognize cash transfers, but it's not just about cash transports or social transfers, but it's also about social transfer, social insurance, labor market policies, and workforce capacities. And while we, while we see cash transfers as an important entry point, we also believe these other elements of social protection are important. So our framework really looks at how do we intentionally and deliberately build synergies. And we believe we have to take a systems approach to this, particularly if we are to make it relevant in, in our development programs, but also in our systems programs, in our, so in our development, our humanitarian programs. So we have five entry points that we've identified that we must build synergies between social protection and nutrition. That's at the evidence level, at the policy governance and coordination level, at the program design level, at the implementation level, and at the monitoring level. And we believe that each of these must constantly have a shock responsive lens. So in, in the next couple of slides, I'm just going to take you through these five entry points and, and give examples for each of what we mean. Next slide. So these just to say that these five entry points in our programming guidance, we look at these as 10 actions, 10 actions that don't necessarily be sequential. Entry points could come through policy. Entry points could come through program design or pilot programs. Um, but certainly um, uh, there's, we, we believe that intentionally we must be focusing on 10 actions across these five entry points. Next slide. So the first entry point is on evidence. Um, and there are two facets to this, of course, always looking for evidence in terms of monitoring impact of programs, but looking at where we do see where poor, poor children or children coming from, from poorer households um, are more mal malnourished. But it's not just about that evidence, it's also about understanding what what social protection programs are in place and what nutrition programs have, are in place and identifying these programs so that we can seek points of entry. The example that I'd like to refer to here is in Malawi, where they did some excellent work of mapping out the social protection programs in Malawi and then looking for opportunities to, to where these could become more nutrition responsive or where the synergies could be built with the nutrition programs. And this then informed um, the uh, revised um, social protection framework. Next slide. The second entry point is on the level of policies, governance, and financing. Um, and this is very much looking at the existing national policies, for example, the nutrition policies, and explicitly 
um, making sure that they recognize social protection as an instrument to improve nutrition outcomes, because that gives us the valuable hook, the commitment um, of which we can build on. Um, for example, in Nepal, uh, the nutrition uh, plan explicitly recognizes the importance of local governance and the importance of using so, uh, social protection and, and cash transfers um, to meet nutrition objectives. Likewise, on social protection policies, they explicitly should have a deliberate objective to addressing malnutrition. But it's not just about the policy levels, it's also about the coordination uh, framework. And we look to Rwanda's excellent example where they have created um, not just at the national level, but platforms for coordination, not just at the, at the national level, but also at the local decentralized level. This, this, these deliberate platforms brought together social protection and nutrition um, at that very local level, which we believe is very important. Next slide. The third entry point, and probably the core of what we talk about, and really to build on what uh, Stephen Devereux and John Hardinett were saying, in our program framework, we really believe that it's about the program design. Um, and this has four elements of it. First of all, the social transfer. And of course, this should reach the most nutritionally vulnerable. So in the inner circle, in the darker circle, we believe that it's the social transfer, the cash transfer or the food transfer should reach the most nutritionally vulnerable. And the most obvious example, of course, is the first thousand days, pregnant and children up to two years. Um, but that itself is not enough. So we believe that explicitly we need then to form program design synergies to ensure that those same households have access to nutritious foods, have access to um, improved practices and services. So it's not just about the um, information counseling and support that, that it is, is well known. It's also about making sure that there's case referrals, that there's um, uh, uh, um, explicit access to nutritious foods for those families. And this is particularly important, we believe, in the inner circle, because not always, as we as we well know, in food, food insecure areas, those nutritious foods are going to be available. So it's explicitly looking at whether that cash transfer is sufficient um, to um, access nutritious foods, because if all three of those are not in place, we're not going to see a change in an improved nutrition traces, or certainly it's going to be limited. The third element of this of this program design that is so important for me, for me is probably one of the most important, is this link to sustained change. So this is the link to the food system that we believe is so important, for example, for those same households to then get referred to programs that support food production, um, livelihood support. It also could perhaps be linked to income um, generation activities, or it could be linked to um, childcare practices but anything that looks at more sustained changes, either in the social protection system, in the food system, or in the health system. And so that's where we see the synergies with this more sustained support for longer term. The fourth element, of course, is the SOC responsive, that all the time we're looking to see if these programs um, can respond and are agile enough to change and adapt where shocks response, not just the cash transfer, which may need to be horizontally or vertically expanded, but also the nutrition programs. Next slide. I think the best way of looking at it is very briefly to look at the example from Zambia. Um, um, and we have many, many examples, but just, just to give a quick example of there, we have an, uh, a cash transfer program um, uh, being delivered um, on a national on a national basis and, and on a pilot basis in, in not across not not across the whole country. And we have also a nutrition program. Um, th this cash program is targeted to pregnant and adolescent girls and children under two. Next slide. So basically, the design of the program, they first did a, a baseline study. But Annalise, sorry to interrupt you. Are you you're getting towards the end of your presentation? Yes, I am. Okay, yeah. thank you so much. And, and quick, 
quick intervention, um, quick summaries in terms of the, the cash there um, that is given to pregnant women, the referrals, um, the link to behavior change, the link to food systems, and of course, underpinning this, the gender empowerment. Next slide. Um, and the most important lesson we learned from this was that the, the program felt that the fact that the, pro, that the program design built on the social existing social protection framework and the nutrition program and built the synergies across that was so important. Next slide. Um, the critical question, though, of course, and this link to the shock response and the nexus, is that this program is in in uh, is in. Um, uh, some districts um, and not across the country. So we're always looking to expand the pro program across the country. The other program is how, the other question is how does it survive under the context of, of, of the crisis? For example, this year they faced a nutrition crisis and we have to um, track and monitor the program to make sure that it's adequately agile and adaptive to respond to the current crisis. So Zambia, I think, is a very good example where we, we're looking in a development context, but of course it faces fragile and um, shock, shocks, um, and we must be ready to respond to those. Next slide. The, the fourth entry point of the five, and then I'll stop, um, is that, of course, at the local level, um, it's about building the linkages in, in information systems and the workforce capacities and getting our local our community health workforce and our social workforce capacity to talk to each other, to dialogue, to work together and to plan together. So we believe at that local level, that's very important. Next slide. The fifth entry point is on the monitoring. Um, and similarly, we would argue that while of course stunting and wasting is important as our overarching um, uh, outcome uh, monitoring tools, we believe that it's very important also to focus on the pathways to improving malnutrition and poverty. And so focusing more on foods, on practices and services. And we've seen this in Kenya where they have observed improvements in, in, in these underlying drivers um, and over much longer term than shifts in, in outcome data. So just finally, as a, as a final slide, um, we would like to emphasize in the program design, it's really about convergence at the local level. It's beyond policies, but really focusing on the local level. It's expanding from these small scale trials to national systems. It's linking the health system, the social protection and the food system together making sure that we're constantly, even in development, looking at, at the ability of both the, all of these three systems to adapt in the shocks. And then of course, looking at the monitoring through the pathways, not just on the outcomes and not just on, on the focus on stunting. So I'll stop there, apologies if I was over time. Thank you so much. Um, that was very, very interesting. And I, I really appreciate all of the, the detailed examples that you provided us from your experience and your work. I think now we'll complement the, the, some of the um, variety of, of lessons that you outlined, Annalise, with um, our last speaker, who is uh, Mr. Paul Onapa. So uh, Mr. Onapa, uh, how has the government of Uganda utilized social protection to change the lives of refugee women? Over to you. Uh, they, thank you very much, um, Philips, uh, for this presentation. I, I mean, for the moderation. Um, this this is uh, the experience of the government of Uganda utilizing social protection to change lives of refugee women through our intervention on the uh, NutriCash uh, program. Uh, broadly, you're sharing the slide. If you could move to the second one. Um, broadly, um, First of all, is to say that um, we use uh, nutrition programming, the child sensitive social pro protection program, to support especially reducing multidimensional poverty among refugee host districts and particularly uh, women and the vulnerable uh, children. And this is because um, the the challenges that are faced have a, a poverty dimension, where we have our poverty headcount indicates uh, twenty one point four percent of all persons living in, in extreme poverty, and then the children um, who are in multidimensional poverty at 56%. You will, you will note that um, we have close to 1.6 million refugees 
which is probably the highest number of refugees um, in, in the world hosted um, in our country. And later on, I'll be sharing about some of the other interventions that we have also uh, achieved um, in, in that regard. We also note that the aspect of hunger um, as a problem for particularly addressing structural, uh, structural poverty, because when you note our national stunting rate is 29%, and in the areas where the refugee hosting districts are, it's even much higher. It is 34% um, in the refugee hosting districts, which is much higher than the national average. And when you look at the, the stunting among children, particularly children with no um, the, the minimum acceptable diet, um, 6 to 23 months is at 66%, which is uh, quite uh, very, very high if you move to the next slide. And in the next slide, we give you a glance on one of the programs, which is the NutriCash program that we have been implementing with the World Food Program to support particularly refugee hosting districts. Um, and 30% of the beneficiaries in this intervention are refugees and 70% are the host communities. And through this intervention, we provide a monthly cash transfer of 48,000 hour shillings, which is about 1.5 US dollars per month. And we inbuild this with a saving component where 30% is retained for mandatory saving. But we also inbuild this to provide the social behavior change communication, which is what the two professors talked about, uh, Professor Devereux and uh, Professor Hopkins, um, particularly to try and build in the key messages on nutrition practices, on hygiene, on sanitation, as a cash plus um, to this intervention. But we also link this to backyard gardening, that we do support the beneficiary households to be able to establish backyard gardens. And this is particularly to enable them have access to fresh foods and diverse diets. Again, this speaks well to what the two professors uh, told us about. But because we're giving them the $1.5 per month, we have inbuilt financial literacy, uh, particularly to train the households in how to manage and uh, use the savings to enhance their participation in income generating um, activities. And this also helps them um, to, to address a couple of vulnerabilities. But we link this also to services, the referral system, and particularly immunization, antenatal care, nutrition screening, screening among others, because we think it's, it's, it's a cash plus, um, as the two professors have indicated. If you could move to the next one. Um, so with this, um, our approach is built on one, the robust partnership with the government, World Food Program, UNICEF, um, and others. Two, we know that this is part of the bigger picture, particularly to build household and community resilience in the refugee hosting districts. And then three is we look at linking and strengthening the linkage between social protection systems and health systems. Um, and, and when you bring this together, as you have seen the Cash Plus program that I've demonstrated, the five different components um, help us. And then looking at this as being transformational with cash transfers pro provided as entry points to address the multi-layered structural issues. And again, it's cash is the entry point, but we layer the social behavior change communication, backyard gardening, financial literacy, and, 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 and also the referral uh, to services. And again, this is innovative because it's delivered through government structures at local and subnational levels, particularly targeting the refugee uh, hosting districts. If you could move to the next slide. And these are some of the results that we have uh, seen. Um, because of the cash plus component of using cash, but layering other support services to it, um, the social behavior change communication, bucket gardening, and financial literacy, and linkage services, we have seen a reduction in anemia rates from 46% in 2010 to 35% um, um, among, particularly among women. And these are 15 to 49 years. And when you talk of this, because remember I told you 30% of all our beneficiaries are refugees and 70% are host uh, communities. And from for children, particular anemia in children, reduced from 62% to 46%. And this is from six to 59 months uh, of, of age. But we have also seen um, that pregnant and breastfeeding women and children under two are receiving a grant, the $1.5 that I talked about. And so far, 13,633 13, have benefited. And because of this, we see that 90% of the beneficiaries have prioritized food uh, production, for uh, food purchase when using the cash received. And as well, they have also used the 70% the, the use their bucket gardens to feed the households. But because of the 
with the education that we gave the financial literacy, we've also been we've also seen them increase participation in income generating activities. Uh, I've set up small businesses, and these have enhanced uh, their incomes. Um, we when because of our, our social behavior change communication, we have seen an increase in consumption of animal sourced proteins from 25% at baseline to 32%. Uh, percent. And again, and this is all to promote uh, di dietary diversity and have um, impacts ac across the board. But also the delivery systems, we have been looking at um, the shifts, one of the shifts that Stephen talked about is on the systems, moving to social protection systems. And through this, we've been able to improve our payment systems through the, 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 the G2 payment platform. We've also, we've also supported our management information systems that have decentralized to the structures. We have the national single registry that we're now updating to have a social registry to inform beneficiary targeting and the grievance handling. But one, one one of the lessons that which we note is one it's very important that there is alignment with government of with the government strategic priorities and this is working well and again and um, this is because the priorities one government has a comprehensive refugee response framework and uh, through the wfp self reliance model we've been able to see that now when we align and because in the comprehensive refugee response framework one of the undertakings that government made is to enhance access to refugees uh, uh, to to act to facilities and services, including but only limited to social protection. And even as I am speaking now, we have already finalized the design of a program to be piloted with the World Food Program to extend the Senior Citizens Grant, which is given to only nationals to refugees. And we are rolling this pilot, starting with 500 uh, refugees in the two districts um, in the West Nile region, which is one one big um, um, step in ensuring that refugees have access to mainstream social protection of, of services. But one of the other lessons we have also learned is the importance of multi-year financing. And this is very critical for sustaining and uh, ensuring that the interventions have a long last imp impact. For example, we have seen the impact of our nutri cash intervention on reducing anemia, on supporting a consumption of rich foods, on income generation, um, and others. But another lesson we've not, we've noted, and this again speaks to what the two professors talked about, is that um, cash alone, without investing in building the systems, uh, may not really achieve long-term results. So investing in um, building, particularly the social protection systems, is very, very critical. We saw, for example, data investing building systems for data management, because if you have data inadequacies, they end up inaccurate targeting, enrollment, and uh, particularly and other services. And that's why now we're building the social registry to support the beneficiary targeting, but then also supporting civil registration. When you look at children uh, who are zero to 59 years, the coverage for civil registration is under 30%. Now, when you have these and they are not registered, then it becomes very difficult to target them and also uh, support them. Where you also look at other aspects like the digitized health records um, and other facilities. So having that linkage between the direct cash intervention and the social protection systems um, is very, very uh, important. If you could move to the next slide. Yes, and in terms of uh, where we go, in terms of the way forward, the, the, the way forward, one, we note that social protection is everyone's business. And uh, um, in our context, it's even everyone's business to ensure inclusion, because when you have 1.6 million refugees who are with you, and because of our geopolitics, they are not about to stop coming, then it means that it is everybody's role to ensure that as you provide social protection, even refugees are included. Now, but when we talk about inclusion of refugees and the women, we note that the challenge of the fiscal space becomes really, really very, very key. Our fiscal space for social protection is quite very low. Our public spending is estimated about 0.7% of GDP, which is among the lowest um, in sub-Saharan Africa. And uh, if you compare to our neighbors, and with all this burden, it becomes uh, a very important to, to expand these opportunities. But we also know that we have the opportunity that our National Development Plan 3 is coming to an end. And this year, we start to develop the National Development Plan 4. So we have the opportunity to write and to support the in the, the putting in place uh, mechanisms for ensuring that social protection is well well captured. Uh, we have tax revenues that we can use 
Um, we have been having discussions and advocacy around how do we finance social protection? Do we go for allocation of a percentage of the GDP? Do we go for now we're discovering oil and hopefully next year we should have oil production, the first in Uganda. We're saying, do we have earmarking part of the oil revenues as experiences from Norway, Alaska and others have told us. So that is a conversation that we are trying uh, to have. But we also have the opportunity of the design of one of the largest uh, social protection programs coming up by the World Bank, the Northern Uganda Social Action Fund, to ensure that the uh, elements of NutriCash are scaled up um, to other regions uh, to be able to to sub to, to ensure that coverage um, is enhanced. But we also have the second phase of the Dr. Deep. Dr. Deep is Development Response for Displaced Impacts Project in 15 hosting districts and also ensuring multi-year funding. So in as I conclude in terms of um, how the, the program, how government has supported refugee women, you look at one, the policy framework, the comprehensive refugee response framework, which details our actions and um, our intentions as government. Then the intervention that we have implemented, I've talked about the NutriCash, which targets uh, children and the results I've seen. There is the development response to displaced impacts project, the Dr. Deep in 15 refugee hosting districts. Again, 15% are women and 70% host districts. I've also talked about the self-reliance model that we have embraced, the one for WFP, and at the moment, the extension of the social security to the refugees by extending the senior citizens grant, which is a universal cash grant to all Ugandans, but also giving access to, to refugees um, in at least the, the, the two communities targeting 15 is a good step in the right direction. And that is how government um, is supporting uh, refugees. If you move to the slide, I think that is it. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you so much. And it's very encouraging to see the positive results that you're achieving and we understand the constraints, but also the, the, the vision of how to expand. Um, okay, I, I'm going to pass now to uh, Saul first to share some views on the interlinkages between social protection and nutrition outcomes and to provide some initial reactions to these presentations. So Saul, you have the floor, Saul Morris, and then Helen will follow. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak to this really interesting webinar. Um, so I am Saul Morris, as was mentioned, I'm from the Global Alliance for Improved Nutrition. We are a Swiss-based NGO and we work improving the consumption of healthy diets for all people, especially the most vulnerable. And that means looking at uh, the availability, affordability and desirability of healthy foods. And that's why we came to be interested in uh, uh, social protection, particularly as its major ability to address affordability, but also um, uh, potentially to address desirability as well. I want to start by a uh, few comments on the uh, presentations we just heard, which I found extremely interesting. And starting with uh, my colleague from UNICEF, just a few points that really caught my attention there. And I think... Um, uh, to be greatly commended. First of all, I felt like she picked up from uh, the presentations we heard from Stephen Devereaux and John Hodnot, which were really focused on impact. But she helped us to understand that there are other aspects uh, of results that are important also. Uh, she mentioned expansion, so that for me is scale. And I think scalability is so important here. Uh, she mentioned inclusion. Uh, and she mentioned also sustainability. So uh, as John Hoddenot said, you know, the, imp the data around impact is very strong now. So we need to be focusing in on how we can achieve scale, inclusion and sustainability as the next challenges in this uh, field. Another point that she made, which I thought was very important was the distinction between designing it right in these programs and then getting it right in the implementation. Both of these are important. We are, have multiple examples of programs that uh, could have been better designed and failed to achieve their impact because of that. But we also have very well designed programs over history that have been poorly implemented and so have failed to achieve their full impact because of implementation. And so as Annalise said, both of these aspects uh, require our attention. She emphasized shocks. And I think this is important as we recognize that malnutrition is not a constant uh, phenomenon these days. 
it varies from year to year. We've seen how El Nino years or La Nina years, depending on the geography, can enormously in, increase the prevalence of malnutrition. Or even uh, well known is the seasonal variations in malnutrition. So uh, uh, malnutrition is close, is a shock related phenomenon. As we look forward to the future when uh, uh, shocks are going to be ever more prevalent, we need to bear that in mind and uh, uh, design around that. The Malawi case study showed us how uh, often social protection landscapes are very complex and very fragmented. I know that, for example, in, in Bangladesh, there are over a hundred social protection programs. So we have to be very strategic and seeing where we can insert nutrition sensitive elements to uh, in such a complex landscape. And finally, I think her design framework really demonstrates UNICEF's unique ability to link across subsystems, which is going to be so important in this uh, uh, whole arena. I did, however, note in the, uh, I hope I understood correctly from the presentation, from the uh, more detailed presentation on Zambia, that we are still talking about numbers of beneficiaries in the tens of thousands. So, uh, and this came out also from the subsequent presentation on Uganda. It's so important that we don't just talk about scale, but actually do scale. Tens of thousands, it's wonderful, a wonderful program clearly, but it's a drop in the ocean compared to what's needed. So moving on then to thoughts on the Uganda uh, presentation. Uh, thank you so much, Paul and Appa. That was really inspiring. Uh, some real strong positives in this program. The emphasis on regularity of transfers that gives uh, uh, the recipients predictability in their incomes. That's something that's so lacking for uh, low income populations. Uh, the fact that you have truly implemented a multi component cash plus, as we've been calling it, intervention, which uh, has the potential to impact nutrition security, unlike the previous generation of programs. And you presented what appears to be some really great impact data on uh, consumption of animal source foods and on anemia. Uh, from what I understood, this seems to be a before after uh, if a type evaluation. That's not the strongest evaluation methodology. So we hope that that would hold if it were con controlled in a more uh, robust methodology. But nonetheless, it seems to be very, very uh, encouraging. And what you found was consistent with all the previous evidence that we've been hearing before. You, we found, you found that 90% of beneficiaries prioritize purchasing food. Uh, as John Hodnot said, this is just what happens always. Uh, we need to just bat off now people who constantly bring us back to preoccupations about purchase of alcohol and the like. It isn't what happens. Very poor people purchase food. Uh, what was perhaps surprising in your program or, or really encouraging was the fact that the transfer was very small. It appears to be $13 a month. Uh, and even with such a small transfer, you've managed to achieve uh, uh, some really great impacts. Um, potential areas to enhance. I'm sure you're thinking about it as well. The other side of affordability, can we actually make nutrient-rich foods more affordable in the same communities so that with this extra income, there's something uh, really accessible to these populations to buy. Uh, maybe we could also think about incorporating the focused budget activity for these households. I know that you worked very much on uh, training in financial literacy. You may have noticed there was a wonderful USAID presentation a few weeks ago on a randomized controlled trial done in Zambia, which looked at a different kind of uh, motivation-based intervention around household budgeting and showed that maybe we don't even need to make saving obligatory. Maybe with a few nudges in that direction, we can encourage households to save. And uh, you yourself mentioned how it's important to build the systems around these programs and create what Stephen Devereaux referred to as uh, social protection systems. And uh, the last point, of course, coming back again to that question of scalability, we don't yet have a good case study of, of really taking these programs to scale in low income countries. I hope that uh, in a few years time, when we have another of these webinars, we'll be seeing uh, some kind of evidence. Thank you very much. I was, would have told you more about GAIN, but uh, 
I thought it was more important to discuss the, the presentations from today. So thank you very much. We appreciate that. So thank you so much for your insightful comments and for um, pointing out some of the things to think more about from, from all of the, those work. Um, Helen, can I pass to you now for your thoughts and comments um, on the presentations, um, as well as um, you know what you've heard, what you've heard so far, please over to you. Yeah, sure. F thank you. Thank you to all great presenters. I can only agree with uh, everything that has been presented. I recognize uh, very well the, the shift uh, Mr. Devu uh, talk about, and maybe I, I, will, I will conclude uh, my uh, um, my presentation with uh, uh, maybe three big shifts that did not happen on the, um, maybe where, where we need to focus on the um, on the impact uh, we we also um, see in uh, in EU program uh, uh, great result at least in terms of uh, of the improvement of diet diversity with uh, uh, safety net programs on an even better result when we have a, a complete a package of intervention. I'm thinking uh, notably of, um, of a, program, a project that was implemented in very fragile area of Burkina Faso at a time when uh, the situation was deteriorating strongly, whether from security or food security. And uh, it was a, a project where we had the chance to have an operational research on uh, and we could, despite all these factors, because of the combined effect of, uh, of cash transfer with uh, a specific nutrition intervention with the enriched flow on uh, behavior change and communication on livelihood support, this whole combination of, uh, of um, activities uh, yields really great results, uh, including on uh, anthropometric data. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, anthropometric follow-up everywhere, but uh, um, we, we don't need to be convinced anymore about the, the relevance of, of this type of uh, action. Um, at the moment, we still have a substantial um, uh, social protection action with a nutrition objective. Uh, it represents approximately 10% uh, of our uh, social protection uh, uh, project with a DAT code on the social protection represent approximately uh, 10% of development aid commitment with a nutrition objective. So it's not the bulk of it, but it's a component of it. And uh, we also have a social protection approach for the humanitarian intervention and uh, in different approach. More and more, uh, we are trying to integrate social protection also to uh, uh, employment on green transition program, also keeping this focus uh, to um, um, uh, to improve nutrition. So we have projects with more and more purpose on trying to get uh, at the same time uh, of covering the most basic needs that are essential for preventing malnutrition also to have uh, transformative factors for lasting change. Uh, it can be on um, uh, on gender, on employment, on climate change adaptation, but we can consile all these uh, objectives in the same programs. The more they are integrated, better the, the results are. So we do have really uh, interesting program at the moment in, uh, in Mali, for instance, a 50 million project uh, implemented for WFP, but uh, integrated as much as possible in the um, national structures. Um, and also in Somalia, the, the Spark program, that is a global gateway project that uh, we can solve the uh, objective of uh, climate resilience on nutrition and with some focus intervention on displaced population and uh, access to health services for, uh, for mother and children. Uh, maybe something that was not uh, developed uh, so much is uh, uh, how um, the social protection uh, for the health system uh, can uh, can support uh, tackling malnutrition. Uh, I see, for example, in Burkina Faso, but also in Sahel, uh, there was a good degree of support of the operationalization of national health insurance fund with uh, all these programs to uh, exempt from uh, health care fees for uh, mother and children under five. Uh, so that happened over the last decades in, in several countries on the uh, uh, integration as well of, uh, of um, community management, the, the treatment of acute malnutrition within the health system. I think that should be also a, a 
be part of a package uh, uh, on uh, nutrition sensitive social protection. Um, maybe on the on the shift that did not happen enough, I think so. And uh, Mr. Onapa already uh, um, touched base on that. Uh, the, the first big shift that didn't happen, happen enough is the scaling up. Uh, we are still uh, too much on the, on the okay great integrated program, but at a, at a, not a micro scale because often we talk about uh, ten thousand of people. We are but we are very far from covering uh, all the most needy. And um, if I recall, you know the discussion we had fifteen years ago when there was the first safety net. We fought, you know, the all twenty percent of poorest uh, poorest people in poorest country would be covered. We are very far from it. So that's uh, definitely a challenge uh, uh, we need to, to uh, affront. Uh, sorry, uh, sometimes I struggle to find my words in English. Um, and another uh, uh, shift that did not happen is the financing. So uh, financing, in, and I see it internally, it's not that we are not convinced that uh, um, social protection uh, uh, with nutrition objective doesn't work. Is But it's, you know, there are many of us competing uh, priorities and uh, um, we we need to, to to get more innovative solution and, and domestic solution to to fund this safety net program and this shift is not happening enough and maybe the uh, another shift that started but not enough uh, we had also uh, some uh, some words of uh, Mr. Napa on this in, uh, in Uganda is the matter of digitalization. Um, it's uh, it's uh, started, but again, uh, not uh, maybe at the scale is need that is needed. Um, I also wanted to inform you that uh, um, we just started a new uh, program on digital social protection with a focus on uh, interpretability on harmonization of digital standards. So it's an 18 million uh, uh, program that started last year and will last uh, till um, 2027. It's implemented by GIZ Expertise France, FIAP, ILO, and soon the World Bank. So maybe also uh, um, more um, uh, possibility uh, of collaboration with, with uh, other type of program, including uh, farmer registries. Um, we, we we need to continue dialogue on that uh, with the INPA uh, ECO NIR, so the, the Commission, uh, on the WFP on FAO. We have started uh, dialogues on uh, social protection for nutrition uh, to improve uh, program design. Uh, we had uh, met uh, twice already in Rome last year and in Brussels uh, in January. Uh, so we, we need to continue this dialogue, this dialogue to to improve uh, uh, the relevance of our program. And maybe just one last point. Uh, as you may all know, there is the Nutrition for Growth Summit that will take place uh, in March uh, next year in Paris. Um, Nutrition for Growth Summit are an opportunity for uh, um, nutrition actors to uh, Take new commitment. Uh, so there is a there is a scope as, as well to, uh, to 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 work on the, on the social protection for uh, nutrition. There will be one uh, technical group, as far as I know, that will start from September on health and social protection. So with the objective of improving nutrition. So I would uh, only encourage you to to be very active in this. Uh, technical group on the, in order to have some great announcement in in March at, at the Nutrition for Growth. Maybe Thank I've you. been a bit quick, sorry. <laughs> no, no, they've been perfect. Thank you. So that's perfect. Um, and I think that you've, you've raised a number of good points about the pathways for scaling um, and the sort of challenges that we still face. So our uh, panelists have been very effective at answering the, the number of questions that have come up in the Q&A, but I would really encourage um, anyone who's participating, we have quite a few participants online to to write their question in the chat, or I suppose if you prefer to raise your hand and ask a question. And in the meantime, um, maybe I can go back to our initial presenters, to Stephen and to John, um, to ask them uh, a little bit about some of their policy recommendations, given the shifts that they outline in the evidence and what they've heard about the case studies. So maybe I could pass to you, Stephen, first, if you're if you're still on, 
to, to say sort of what you think are the next steps for this sector for nutrition sensitive social protection. Thank you very much. And thanks to the other presenters. I really found that an extremely insightful and informative um, set of presentations. And what struck me is that it's almost as though we coordinated in advance because we all seem to reinforce each other's messages. Um, so for me, I would say the main, um, I think John called them stylized facts. I think the main stylized fact that emerges for me is the fact that we now recognize that to achieve, to achieve nutrition outcomes, to improve child nutrition status in particular, cash is not enough. You need to have complementary interventions. Most of us mentioned, for example, behavior change communication, but also links to nutrition specific interventions, not just, uh, you're not just pushing, nudging people towards healthier diets, but also making sure that there, there is actually nutritious foods available and accessible to households, along with cash, which we must not forget meets a range of needs and sometimes more than just the person who is the labeled beneficiary. So, um, and a point that hasn't been made, so let me just mention this. I think one of the reasons why we don't see big nutrition impacts from um, cash transfers alone is because cash transfers are inadequate. And I don't mean just that they are too small. I mean that we don't recognize sufficiently the range of needs that households have for cash. So it's very unlikely that even something like a food, a food transfer, a food based, I mean, a cash based food transfer is going to be spent entirely on food. And it's not going to be spent entirely on the child or the older person. If it's a pension, it's going to be split among the household. And those dilutions of the uses and the users of cash transfers is another reason why we can't expect to improve nutrition status just by increasing the value of cash transfers. The nutrition supplementary and the nutrition specific interventions are absolutely crucial. So I would say that, yes, I'll, 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 my main takeaway from this is integrated pro programming is essential. Social protection plus cash transfers plus um, and we've learned a lot from the ex from the experiences that we've just been um, exposed to. So thanks, everybody. Thank you so much. John, do you have anything you would like to add to that? Uh, apart from agreeing with Stephen um, on all his points, I thought I'd offer up the following. I think a point made in the uh, discussion about scaling up is a very important one. We actually do have a very good example of that, and that was Ethiopia's Productive Safety Net Program. In its fourth phase, had an explicit mandate to improve both food security and nutrition. There was high level political support for it. There was a lot of administrative support at local levels for its implementation. My take is it did not work terribly well. And what this reflected uh, was the following. First, it relied heavily on health, uh, frontline health workers who are already very heavily overcommitted. It did not have the amount of time necessary and needed to implement the social and behavior communication change activities. Those activities were very limited. And so that reduced the efficacy of that component of the work. And going back to Stephen Dever's observation, uh, this program took place in an environment where you had very poor and food insecure households. And households oftentimes would very poor access to poor access either physically or economically uh, to nutrient dense foods. So I think what we're and where this then takes me is the following is that we have a growing evidence base, which is strong, which is pointing us in the direction of cash plus interventions. But increasingly, that evidence base is telling us is that we need to hit on all the constraints that adversely affect children's nutritional status, energy intake, health, feeding practices, uh, the consumption of a diverse nutrient dense diet, and interventions which ultimately only hit on some of these, but not all, are unlikely to have uh, significant meaningful effects. That's great, thanks. And I think that uh, John, you helped to respond to the question Catherine was asking about some of the um, some of the constraints for scaling up uh, to achieve um, impact at scale. There's actually another question um, in the in the chat now from Asha asking about how we can get different ministries or sectors to collaborate, like health, food security, nutrition, wash, social protection, and how we go about coordinating. Paul, I wonder if you want to reflect on that from your experience, or Annalise, from the the standpoint of um, of UNICEF. Would one of you like to come in on that? Great. 
I, I can come in very quickly, um, Lawrence. Um, just, I think that's the critical. So building on, on, uh, um, on the earlier point about addressing all the constraints, I couldn't agree more. And this is one of the constraints as well, that we have no choice now but to work together and support uh, work together as agencies that at the local level, you know, take it right down to the local level um, as agencies and partners of government and support government, local government to really bring these different sectors together. So that was just, I feel like there is huge momentum at the at the sort of global level and interest and commitment, but we really have to take that from sort of global commitments right down to, to working that out in practice. And that means coming together across shared vision, but right down to the local level. That's great, thanks. Um, Paul, do you have anything you'd like to add to that or to the question about scaling? Thank you there. Hello, hello. Please. Yes, uh, from my part, sorry, I'm in a noisy place, um, but allow me just to say that a building collaboration is a deliberate effort that you have to invest in. And that's why from us, for example, we said, first is we build the collaboration between system strengthening and social protection, but also more importantly, between the government and the UN agencies, but also more importantly, between the government at national and subnational levels. So we have structures in place across all these spaces where we do enhance collaboration to achieve better results for nutrition and outcomes for social protection. So it's a deliberate effort that one must invest in and uh, roll with it. Uh, thank you. Thank you. That's very helpful. Um, there don't seem to be any more questions in the chat at the moment. Well, there is one that Robert has asked him to directly to John. Maybe you want to have a look at that and see. But I, I would like to pose a question um, to, to any of you who are interested in, in answering, which is about the role of, um, you talked a lot about behavioral change, but something else that uh, our division works on a lot is social norms and changes related to roles um, assigned to people of different genders. So women's roles in terms of care, feeding practices, et cetera, versus men. And maybe somebody would like to comment on the relationship between, um, you know, the kinds of uh, approaches, nutrition sensitive, uh, social protection you've been speaking about and gender sensitive social protection. Not to put anyone on the spot. <laughs> John or Stephen, if you would like to start, if you're, you're welcome to do so. Or Annalise, I just saw you came online. If you'd like to answer, please go ahead. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think Annalise is better placed than I am to answer this. Excellent. Um, please go ahead. Sure. And I think um, I think it's an excellent question, Lauren. And I I would like to answer it on a couple of 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 of, of, of dimensions. First is that we mustn't think about um, the. Um, when we think about building the synergies between these programs, we have to think about synergies between quality programs. So. We're putting a huge demand on ourselves. So just sort of a bit of social behavior key messages at distribution sites isn't going to work. So we need to bring in a very comprehensive behavior change program that's quality and that's effective and build synergies with that. So we mustn't, we're not off the hook just to then throw out a, a sort of, um, you know, a few key messages um, and, and so I really would like the first point is to, that we have to create these really quality programs. There's short term changes that have to be or short term changes in feeding practices. But then there's also, I think, underpinning all of this is this gender element and how we build in a long term transformative gender change, starting with the cash transfers. But that's also not enough. So what we've seen in some of our programs, real change in, in, in women's capacity for decision making, especially when it's linked to income generating programs or food production, because it's not just about the cash, but it's also about this really feeling empowered to make changes in the way that they um, do pra feeding practices. But it's beyond that. It, it, it's, it's more sort of employment or income. It's also recognizing the role of uh, child care, child care services, so that women can go to work. So it's really looking at the shorter term changes in practices, but also the longer term, so that we begin to address the normative and the social norms that you refer to. 
That's great, thanks. Yeah, I think there's there's quite a lot of evidence on the importance of empowerment for children's nutrition, women's empowerment in particular for children's nutrition. So that's, that's helpful. John, I see you you might want to come in on this as well, please. Yeah, maybe I'll just jump in with a couple of additional observations building on what Annalise just described. One of which is that at points in time, there has been concern that cash transfers which are made to women might actually increase the incidence or the severity of intimate partner violence. The idea being is it's changing the distribution of ownership of financial resources within the household in ways that men find threatening. And my take is the strong preponderance of evidence on that suggests that that is not proved to be an issue for practice. Uh, that's not to say it's something that shouldn't be monitored. Uh, but arguably, intimate partner violence has many causes, but one of which is stress is induced by poverty. And the fact that households are receiving these transfers um, is a mechanism for reducing those stresses and not for reducing the Second part is that within the context of the nutrition SBC, oftentimes there's an interest in engaging fathers in these areas and being supportive of efforts to improve nutritional status of children. And my take on this literature is that it needs to be done carefully. There's clearly, it's important to bring fathers into this conversation, but there is a risk that fathers might interpret this as think, thinking that in fact, that they are now the experts, not their, their partners or their wives, and therefore start taking over things in ways which actually are disempowering in a space where women actually have some autonomy. That's great, thank you. I'm, I'm also interested by that research. Um, I think we're coming to the time of closing. So I really want to thank the panelists and discussants, and of course, all of you for who have been listening in, participating and asking your questions in the audience for this very interesting discussion. And, and I think as, um, as uh, our colleague said um, from the EU, then there was a lot of overlap and interest in, in what you said. So it was, it was a great pleasure for me to listen and to moderate the event. Um, I wanna pass the floor to Abigail Perry, who's the Director of Nutrition at WFP for closing remarks. Um, and also say that we we will continue to have a dialogue series on social protection, and we encourage all of you to keep interested in listening into that. So, Abigail, let me pass to you. Thank you for being here. Thanks so much, Lauren. Um, I have to say that it's been an enormous privilege to have the opportunity to listen to um, such a real set of experts on the topic of nutrition sensitive social protection. Um, I, I hope everybody on the line. Uh, fully appreciates uh, what a real privilege it is to be, to have the benefit of the insights of uh, of all the colleagues who've spoken uh, today. Really very impressive. Um, I think it's really clear that we've got these rich insights now into the potential that social protection presents in various ways for addressing malnutrition. And we're really in this uh, fortunate position of having solid evidence, less solid evidence and uh, real practical experience on how we can optimize the potential that social protection presents. And this includes around the recognition of the importance of really including uh, explicit nutrition objectives in design and delivery of social protection uh, uh, mechanisms and systems, the important continued recognition of, of the need to target the first 1,000 days if we're going to really achieve nutritional uh, impacts. Um, but also really fundamentally, this recognition of the need to link to other services and support, including around health, other basic services, nutrition, the role of social behavior change, uh, communication and beyond. So moving forward, I think the, the kind of real key takeaway from this discussion is just how important it is that we can actually really collectively harness these insights and experience to support governments to really translate this into impactful and sustainable social protection systems. And I know Annalise and others really acknowledge that importance of us coming together. Um, I think the different agencies and, and perspectives that are reflected um, on this session today uh, really give a, a really important insight into the fact that, that we need to you know, kind of harness that collective energy and, and expertise and enable governments to really translate this into scalable and sustainable systems. I think this is really more important than ever. First, because um, we are seeing governments recognizing more and more the important role that social protection plays. Um, I think it was Stephen uh, that referenced the, the kind of the role that the COVID-19 pandemic played in terms of acknowledging the value of social protection mechanisms to protect uh, the poorest communities, protect people whose uh, livelihoods were fundamentally compromised. 
Um, but we're also dealing with a situation where the levels of food insecurity and malnutrition that we're facing around the world are frankly unmanageable. And much of this is still happening in countries and contexts where we are dealing with very predictable and recurrent crises. And again, I think um, Saul mentioned, you know, the 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 unpredictability or, the, or not unpredictability, but these kind of crises that come from factors like El Nino. The reality is that even these are quite predictable and social protection mechanisms that have nutrition sensitivity built in, but also have that adaptive nature offer a real, really important potential to uh, operate in a much more efficient, effective and dignified way than the current continued over-reliance on humanitarian funding, which um, ensures that we're, we're kind of taking quite compromised approaches and indeed where governments are not really taking necessarily taking the lead in terms of addressing these recurrent uh, and indeed in many cases chronic needs. So moving forward, I think there's kind of importance for us to come together Provide really joined up advice, guidance and support to governments is key. Um, I know as our colleague from Uganda referenced, um, I think the bandwidth at government level, but also fiscal space is such that if we don't join up our efforts, we're not really going to enable us to move forward in a way where we can optimise the potential that social protection presents. And I think this is an important challenge for all of us to make sure that we can join up our voices, our advice, our guidance, building on the evidence and experience that exists. Final thing to note that while I, you know, social protection and the experiences we've had is a really key way for us to be able to protect people who are, who are at most at risk of malnutrition. Um, we we can't really neglect the importance of investment more broadly in food systems, in health systems, and the actions that will actually fundamentally enable populations to be lifted out of poverty, lifted out of a chronic risk of malnutrition. And as we head towards another Nutrition for Growth Summit. Um, with, with really important leadership from the French government. I think we also need to work quite hard to get the balance of messaging right, because for sure we need social protection mechanisms to be able to do what they're there to do and to have an optimal impact. But equally, if we're going to enable people to access healthy and nutritious foods, if people can access help to, for people to access health services, uh, education services, we also need those broader investments. So again, a really kind of joined up effort among the nutrition community in terms of the actions we would like governments to take and the, and the investments donors need to take is going to be really key to ensure um, that we can really uh, boost human capital and indeed achieve targets around ending malnutrition by 2030. So enormous thanks again. Really appreciate the engagement with all of all the colleagues on the line and really look forward to the continued discussion on this very important topic. I think that's it from us today and look forward to the next uh, session. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.